I'm just going to talk a little bit, really briefly, and I'm happy to take any questions, but I'm going to talk a little bit about biblical theology. What is biblical theology? Just because I, I haven't talked about that before. And, and what is biblical theology? I like what Jim Hamilton says. Jim Hamilton has a little book called What is Biblical Theology? And he says it's the in, interpret... I can't smell this morning. The interpretive perspective of the authors or author. So biblical theology, when you're talking about biblical theology, we're talking about the um, inductively uh, finding the, the themes of, of the author. Uh, what, what concerns the author? So, so for example, I, I don't know if I did anything with it in, in this book. I did in my New Testament theology. But so, for example, you won't find in a systematic theology, probably, maybe there's an exception, you won't find riches and poverty as a theme. But it's clearly a theme in Luke Acts. Right? That's a concern of Luke. There's a lot on riches and poverty in Luke Acts. So, uh, you know, that's just an example of something that's not treated in most systematic theologies, but it's clearly a concern for uh, Luke, a Luke Acts. And since I'm thinking of Luke Acts, another concern, there's like, there's a, maybe a, a concern for the, you could, the down and out. You know, it's, it's very clear reading Luke Acts that um, he, ha he has a concern for the, the poor, uh, for women, for the, those who are oppressed, and so forth and, and so on. So, um, you inductively trace what's going on. Systematic theology, I mentioned this yesterday, tends to be, notice the word tend, tends to be more atemporal. Whereas biblical theology focuses, and I said this yesterday, more on the historical timeline. By which the story unfolds. And, I, and of course we've been doing that in this class. Maybe more, more, more historically centered and based. So in, in biblical theology, we're, we're, we're more concerned to always think of where the book is, to think of antecedent, antecedent theology. So obviously, when we come to Joshua, for example, when we come to Joshua, it's informed by the, by the Pentateuch, right? We always think of what has come before. It's feeding into the story of the book we're in. Well, all scholars, theologians across the board agree with these understandings of systematic and biblical theology, pretty much. Uh, I think all would agree, all would agree <laughs> that uh, Systematic theology has a different concern than biblical theology. Yeah. There, there are, yeah, there are different approaches, though, to biblical theology, different emphases. Maybe I could remember, and I don't remember the exact title now. I require it in my New Testament theology class. There's a book by Darian Lockett, and uh, does he go by Edward Clink? I mean, I call him Mickey Clink, uh, but I think it's Edward Clink, and it's, anybody know the name of that book? Understanding biblical theology, and um, I think they give five different emphases or types of biblical theology in there. Where you know you have kind of the redemptive historical approach of Carson, you have a more narrative approach, more canonical approach, more historical approach. 
the kind of emphasis. That's a very good book to read. It's not very long, by the way. Uh, by the way, they both, uh, just down the road here, taught at Talbot. Um, um, Mickey is now pastoring in the Chicago area. But uh, uh, Darian Lockett, I know Darian very well. Darian was one of the committee members who worked on the Christian Standard Bible with me. And uh, yeah, he's just such a wonderful, kind person. By the way, if you're thinking of biblical theology in the uh, general epistles, uh, Darian's writing and working on this, uh, on the general epistles a lot. So, so there are some, I'm not here really to talk about all those differences, but there are some differences, different emphases. Um, so we always, we always want to think, where are we in the storyline? So I'm, real, I'm focusing on my definition. Where are you in the storyline? What feeds into it? So, right, when we read, so when we, we're reading the book of the 12, obviously we've got the rest of the Old Testament informing it. And especially when you think of, I'm just picking a theme, you know, the covenant lawsuit, of course, that's informed by all we know about covenant uh, from the rest of the story. I mean, just try to imagine, try to imagine reading the prophets without the, knowing the previous uh, story, <coughs> without knowing the covenants. Uh, that'd be extraordinarily difficult. So there's antecedent theology, and then I'd say there's a canonical contribution. or canonical element, maybe, is the best way to say it. In other words, we also we read the story in light of the whole. In light of what is coming. And of course, systematic theology does that too, doesn't it? I mean, these two overlap. But we, we, read, we read the story in light of the whole, wouldn't we, and I, and I just freely do that again and again in this class, right? When we read about the Messianic promise, I talk about Jesus. <laughs> um, they didn't know who Jesus was, right? They didn't know the Messiah in the Old Testament was going to be Jesus of Nazareth. When, I, when they talk about the New Covenant, I talk about the church. So we're, we're, all, we're, we're reading uh, canonically. We're thinking in terms of the promise, you know, when we, we talked about the temple yesterday in Ezekiel, and you may not have agreed with what I said, but I'm reading it in light of the whole canon, too. I'm, we're, not, we're not just reading Ezekiel uh, 40 through 48. Now, this is a very important element of biblical theology. Obviously, people may differ with specific interpretive decisions, but if you're not, if you're not reading Scripture in light of the whole canon, you're, you're not reading... Scripture is a Christian, <laughs> right? Uh, you, if, and that, you know, the most obvious example I always give, I think I gave it in this class, is Leviticus. You can't read Leviticus 1 through 7 and say, well, maybe we ought to offer animal sacrifices. You automatically read it canonically as a Christian, don't you? Rightly. You read it in light of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So uh, we, you've got to do canonical theology to do uh, true biblical theology. Now, of course, if you, those who aren't evangelicals who do biblical theologies, they, they don't have this view of the coherency of the story. They, they, think, they, they may think there are contradictions in the story. Um, so they, they're going to approach biblical <laughs> theology differently. Somebody like, you know the name James Barr? I mean, James Barr, I, in the Locket and Clink book, he's the historical approach. And I mean, Barr, Barr by the way, Barr at one point, Point, traveled with Martin Lloyd Jones when he became very liberal. He wrote a book on fundamentalism, which is in, interesting to read even today. Um, he really disliked. Uh, I, I don't think he's still alive. Maybe he is, but Barr really disliked fundamentalism, <laughs> and uh, and and you can think of uh, for a canonical approach, which is another chap chapter in Link, Clink, Clink and Lockett. Yeah, that's how I have to say. Reverend Childs is the canonical approach. So there's a, and by the way, he's written a lot in biblical theology. We can learn a lot from Childs. And uh, what's the difference between what I'm saying about 
reading it canonically in child. Child, child's just is is still. Um, you could put this different ways. Historical critical. And of course, in one sense, we're all historical critical. That is, we read in historical context, and if critical means exercising wise judgment, <laughs> we all do that. But when I'm, I'm just, as a shorthand, I'm using historical critical here in the sense that he buys into, he buys into the typical view of, uh, of the tradition that's found in Old Testament scholarship. So, for example, if you read Childs as biblical theology, he might say, I don't remember what he says, he might say, well, actually, historically, it's Trito Isaiah. And uh, he might say there are many sources feeding into the book. But then he'll say, but let's read the book as a whole. Let's read the book as a whole anyway. Let's read it as a canon. Well, you know, as one of my professors said about this view, it's kind of a, in some ways, it's sort of neo-orthodox, right? I mean, Childs has neo-orthodox leanings. You, uh, you're going down the slide, and halfway through, you say, let's stop. <laughs> We're stopping right here. Well, you can force yourself to do that, but the, the, there's a lack of consistency there. So I think Childs' program, I like the fact that he wants to read canonically, and th therefore we can read Childs, and we can get the pearls out of it. But the disadvantage of Childs' approach is, um, you know, there's a lot of historical critical stuff. When I, his Exodus commentary, when I used it, when I preached through Exodus, I would just, I would just skip that stuff. I'd say, okay, okay, boom, 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 okay. Gerhard von Rad, I read him the same way. I just skip over and I just look for the good stuff because sometimes the good stuff is extremely profound in these guys. Anyway, I'm getting off the subject. So that, that, that's a pretty simple little presentation. But I think, you know, read, read in its historical context. Find the interpretive perspective of the author. Recognize we have a storyline. Think of antecedent theology, what's feeding into the book. And then think of the whole. Think of the whole canon. Anything you want to say about that? Yeah. Um, how should one's views on, say, you know, covenant theology, new covenant theology, dispensational theology impact the, the task of biblical theology? Well, ideally, of course, ideally, we are, we're always letting our biblical theology reconfigure, reshape our systematic. I mean, at least that's how I understand biblical theology. It, 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 it's like exege in exegesis, we're, we're always willing to consider our system being reshaped. On the other hand, on the other hand, it's not, I don't agree with those who say it's I, better if we come to the text with a blank slate, a tabula rasa. No, it's inevitable that we come to the text with, with a theology. That's not a bad thing to come to a text we recognize. I mean, we do anyway, right? We all come to the text with a particular theology. I think the question is, are we willing to let it be reshaped by the text? So, you know, um, if you're a dispensationalist or a covenant theologian or whatever, sure, come to the text with your covenant theology or your dispensationalism, fine. But then be open to the text Reconfiguring it is what I'd say. So, um, your question reminds me because <coughs> seminary students, naturally, people like me who teach, we like to think about where do dispensationalists, covenant theologians, and, pro and uh, progressive covenantalists, I suppose, where do we differ from each other? But I do like to say, we have to stop and think once in a while, maybe more than once in a while. Actually, we mainly agree, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, we have our differences, but you know, that's what we like to do in, in, when we talk about theology. We like to talk about where we disagree. It's just more fun, right? But we mainly agree. I, th I think that's an important thing to say. We're, we have some differences. 
But overall, we may, we, there's more agreements than disagreements. We're closer to one another than we sometimes think. The reason we think, oh, we might think, well, we're kind of far from one another. One reason we tend to think that way is we concentrate in our discussions on where we disagree. And therefore, it ends up showing up in books, right? And articles. So, but we just need to remember, we, we agree on so much. So, yeah. Any, any other questions or comments about this? Okay, let's talk about the Book of the Twelve, quickly. So we're not surprised, speaking of antecedent theology, that the covenant plays a huge role. So I put this together in my book. We think of, we think of these covenant lawsuits, and we see the theme again. We see the theme again of, uh, of whoredom, right, in Hosea, in a remarkable way. And we, we, we see the curses of the covenants and the covenant violations. So, you know, the prophets hit these same themes over and over again. And so why, why, why do we have in the canon such a repetition? I take it because these themes are very, very important and they need to be impressed upon our minds and our hearts. Hence, we have such a, such a repetition of, uh, of judgment. Um, I, I like Amos 3.2. Um, it's a striking verse where it says, You only have I chosen, you only have I known, speaking of Israel, right? You only have I chosen, you only have I known of all the nations of the earth, therefore I'll punish you for your iniquities. <laughs> Sounds like it's going to be something pretty good, right? Uh, you only have I chosen, therefore I'm going to zap you <laughs> because you're disobeying. Um, so we see, we see this in all the prophets. Yahweh is a witness against the nation and Micah. You know, you see that covenant lawsuit in Micah. Um, you see Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk's a fascinating book. Can I, you know, I can give you Habakkuk in a minute or two, right? The, the book opens and Habakkuk says, why, 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 are you, why aren't you doing anything about sin in the nation? Uh, and God says, I will, I'll use the Babylonians. And then Habakkuk says, how can you do that? <laughs> they're even worse than us. Then God basically says, well, I'll get them. <laughs> Don't worry, their turn's coming. And then the end of chapter three is salvation's gonna come through judgment, right? In that great hymn, in that great song. So. I have to tell you something about Habakkuk that you can use for your congregation sometime that I, I heard from Ray Steadman. He was encouraging his church to read the Bible, and this is what he said, and I thought it was fabulous. He said, um, someday when you go to heaven, you're going to meet Habakkuk, and he's going to ask you, how did you like my book? So, <laughs> and, uh, and if you've never read it, then you'll try to avoid Habakkuk for all eternity, you know? <laughs> Be embarrassed, you know, like, I never read your book. Man, I was part of the Bible. I, I actually had a person I taught Bible with, so I taught three different places and lot, with lots of people, and he confessed to me one day, he said, I have never finished reading the Bible in English. And so um, I immediately told him he was going to hell. I didn't say that. So. <laughs> Since he was confessing his sin, I was sympathetic, but, you know, he... Hey, you teach the Bible. You should read the whole Bible. <laughs> kind of a shocking word, right? So I reported him to the president, and he was fired the next day. I didn't do that, of course. Anyway, I'm speaking of such stories. When I was in seminary, um, when I was in seminary, uh, one of the um, students I was next to, the professor said, turned to Ezra, and he couldn't find it, and he was so discouraged, he said, I think I ought to drop out of seminary. I, you know, it wasn't really that important, was it? I mean, it's good to know where it is, but I don't think you have to drop out if you don't know where it is. So we see this in Malachi as well. I mean, we can look at details, um, but we're not going to look at details. Then we see a huge theme in the prophets, right? Really, it's a subset of what we're talking about in terms of covenant 
covenant defection, um, we see the theme of the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord is a very prominent theme. I'm sure you've seen it. Of course, we didn't talk about this, but the day of the Lord is a very prominent theme in Isaiah and uh, Ezekiel as well. Uh, plays a big role. Um, of course, these passages are disputed. I understand both chapters 1 and 2 of Joel to refer to locusts. Uh, some people think chapter 2 refers to an, a physical army. I mean, if you've had a course on going through the prophets, I'm sure you've thought about these things. But he, he calls upon Israel to weep and wail and to lament, to call for an assembly, to repent. Beautiful language. Um, honestly, you know, uh, many, many of our churches, this is at the place they are, really. Many of our churches, um, really in the Southern Baptist Convention, we have 45,000 churches. But, uh, you know, as it's often said, we're a mile wide and an inch deep. I think that's true. And uh, there's a great need for reformation in our churches. If our churches could get their act together, we'd have a, we'd have a greater impact on society. But the problem is our churches are so weak. And, uh, of course, that was true in Israel of Israel in Joel's day, wasn't it? And Amos says, you're looking forward to the day of the Lord because the day of the Lord is the day of salvation. But he goes, it's not going to be a day of light for you, but a day of darkness. It's not going to be a day of salvation, but a day of judgment. And we see Zephaniah picks up the same way. Zephaniah picks up this image and says, the day of the Lord is going to be a day of sacrifice. And you're going to be the sacrifice. <laughs> right? Once again, it's going to be a day of judgment. It's going to be a day of wrath. Zephaniah's portrayal of the day of the Lord is very interesting because it's, it's worse than the flood. Because if you remember, the judgment is so sweeping in Jeremiah, and it includes the fish of the sea. So it's absolutely uh, comprehensive. So as I say, they're more thorough than the flood. So you're to, Zephaniah, much like Joel, you're to assemble together, Israel's to assemble together and seek the Lord. Obadiah. Obadiah is uh, only one chapter, right? A, sh short, a short book. When I took my Bible survey class, my professor said the way to remember this book is Edom up Ob Obadiah. So that's right. It's about the judgment of Edom, right? So Edom up Obadiah, that's how to remember it. So um, it's all about the day of the Lord, right? The day of the Lord is going to be the judgment of Edom. Edom, though, Edom begins to become sort of a symbol of unbelievers in general, right? The, it, it, Edom, e, Edom it, it represents the ungodly world. So what happens to Edom historically is going to happen to all, all the wicked. The book of Nahum is a very remarkable book. Nahum, I always say that uh, Jonah's favorite book was Nahum, uh, since it's the judgment of Assyria. Right? Just joking a little bit, but um, Nahum predicts the judgment and quite striking language, isn't it? Language that many people in our church, they don't, they don't hear words like this in preaching. I know here, praise God, that here you believe in preaching the whole counsel of God, right? The whole plan of God. Because in many churches, a book like this would never be preached or discussed. Because it begins, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is fierce in wrath. The Lord takes vengeance against his foes. He is furious with his enemies. The Lord is, but, right, man, that is powerful. But then he says, right, the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. He's, he's not quick to go to judgment, but he does judge, doesn't he? The Lord will never leave the guilty unpunished. His path is in the whirlwind and storm, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. And Nahum goes on to say, who can withstand his indignation? The answer, nobody. <laughs> nobody can. Who can endure his burning anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. Even rocks are shattered before him. But the Lord is good, isn't he? A stronghold in the day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. If you take refuge in him, he'll protect you from the judgment. But if you're against him, he'll destroy you. I like what Abraham Heschel says. Is it not because we are only dimly aware of the full gravity of human failure, of the sufferings inflicted 
by those who reviled God's demand for judgment. There's a cruelty. I love the sentence. There's a cruelty which pardons. That's the false god. That's the idol of most people in our culture today. That the, the, the tr true God would always pardon. There'd be no judgment. Just as there is a pity which punishes, severity must tame whom love cannot win. I think that's very exactly right. Um, of course, Jonah, you're very familiar with Jonah. Very strong emphasis on God's love for the nations. Salvation is of the Lord. God's sovereignty in the book, the Lord's compassion for the nations. But so you, you see the judgment in the, prop, in, the, in the 12, but also you see the promises of uh, salvation. Uh, you, you, you see the promise of return from exile. I'm, I might come back to this for, to Hosea 11 when we do Matthew. We really see the new covenant here, don't we? I'll, I'll bet I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. You'll, you'll be my faithful wife. I'll heal their apostasy. That's the new covenant, isn't it? I will love them freely. But Israel will spend many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household god. But they shall return and seek. So here's the promise. They will seek the Lord their God and David their king. So there's that messianic promise. David's been long dead, isn't he? So he's not talking about the literal David anymore, but his descendant. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. That's where we, if we read that canonically, clearly we see that it's fulfilled in the new covenant. Joel, we think of Joel, the great promise of the Spirit being given to all flesh. You're very familiar with that. But there are, there's also salvation on the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment and salvation for his people. Israel will dwell in Zion, my holy mountain. So there we, so there we pick up, right? There's going to be a new, Garden of Eden, um, a new Garden of Eden, isn't there? The, the, the holy mountain is the holy garden. Yahweh dwells in Zion. Yahweh dwells in the new Jerusalem. Well, Revelation 21 and 22, that new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, right? To earth. There's the new creation where mountains shall drip with sweet wine and the hills shall flow with milk. Well, that's poetic language, isn't it? Poetic language of the lavishness and beauty of the new creation. Amos, there's not much in Amos, by the way, about a future promise, but it is there. The fallen booth of David will be repaired and reestablished. Edom will be conquered. <laughs> but Acts reads that as including the salvation of the Gentiles. Do you remember that? James mentions that passage at the Council of Jerusalem where it's decided that circumcision is not necessary for salvation. And James reads that passage in Amos is including the salvation. So notice here, it's just talking about Edom, but James reads that passage as, as including the salvation of all Gentiles, which gives us, right, hermeneutical warrant for what we've actually already seen in the Old Testament, that Edom begins to expand beyond Edom, that it represents unbelievers generally. And James says, the Gentiles will be saved. Joel says the mountains shall drip with sweet wine, very much like Amos, right? That, that promise. Israel's fortunes will be restored. Obadiah, some in Mount Zion will escape and be holy. A remnant will be saved. Israel will possess the land of its enemies. The land promise will be fulfilled. What does Romans 4, 13 tell us? The land is the world. Abraham is heir of the world. So now, now the land promise isn't just Canaan, but in the new creation, it's the whole universe is transformed. I take it the new creation is on a new earth. I understand the new creation to be this present universe, renewed, purified, restored. So we'll have resurrection bodies, we'll be on a new earth, and we're going to be heirs of the world. The whole universe will be ours. What will that be like? I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be great. We know that. Saviors will shall, shall go up to Zion to 
rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So there it is, the kingdom shall be the Lord's, that all the kingdom promises will be fulfilled. We see this in Micah as well. Yahweh will assemble the lame and gather those who are driven away. The, Israel's leader will come from Bethlehem. You're, you're very familiar with that prophecy, right? He shall be great to the end of the earth. He shall be their peace. Israel will bless the nations. There'll be a new exodus. Yahweh will shepherd his people. I, I like this one. Where Micah says, the Lord's enemies shall lick the dust like a serpent. Genesis 3.15, right? The, the offspring of the woman will win. The enemies will lick the dust like a serpent. Like the crawling things of the earth, they shall come trembling out of their strongholds. And some... <laughs> shall turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you. You will again, God, a, a, a great gospel verse, right? He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's a wonderful, beautiful promise, isn't it? So, um, Diane and I, had the privilege of hearing a Corrie Ten Boom before she died. At a, she was speaking at a conference. She was 80-some years old. You, you all know who Corrie Ten Boom is? Anybody know who, know who she is? The, the uh, Dutch woman along with her family that hid uh, uh, Jews in their house from the Nazis and then they were discovered and uh, sent to the concentration camp, what, Ravensbrück, wasn't it? And uh, uh, her sister died there. Uh, her father died during those years as well. And uh, Corey lived and was uh, well known for her love, her forgiveness of those who injured her. And uh, she was a very joyful person. Um, I don't fully endorse this exegetically, but I, I thought you'd get a kick out of this. She said at the conference, uh, this, this had to be late 70s, early 80s. She said, people ask me about my view of the millennium. And she said, totally skirted the issue. She said, I think that is a preposterous question. So, yeah, so she didn't tell us what she thought. Anyway, she, she was just a very joyful person. But I think of her whenever I read this verse because she says, God has thrown our sins into the deepest sea. God has thrown our sins into the deepest sea. And then she said, and he puts a sign up, no fishing. Isn't that great? No fishing. Don't go back to those sins. God's forgiven them. So uh, I look forward to getting to know her along with Habakkuk in the future. Habakkuk looks forward to the kingdom coming in its fullness, right? And the, when the day of the Lord comes, you know, do you see how this relates? When the day of the Lord comes, there's judgment of the wicked. This, the offspring of the serpent are destroyed. And the offspring of the woman are vindicated. And, and then the earth, the kingdom will come. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What, what a great promise that is. How beautiful that is. How our hearts resonate with that. Isn't it amazing how many beautiful and wonderful passages there are in Scripture? How much people miss that they don't read these books, right? The, 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 of course, the words of judgment, but wonderful words of salvation. And then we have that fascinating chapter about the new exodus, judgment, and salvation in chapter 3. Judgment isn't the last word in Habakkuk 3. Finally, Habakkuk will rejoice in the Lord. He's looking forward to God's salvation, even if the fig tree doesn't blossom and there's nothing on the vine. Finally, there's going to be salvation, right? Through the judgment's going to come salvation. So Habakkuk's not just saying, I rejoice in the Lord even though we're going to be destroyed forever. That's not what he's saying, right? He's saying, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. Judgment's coming and through and the judgment, salvation's coming. We're going to tread on high places. So we see the same in Zephaniah. He looks forward to salvation for the Gentiles, a pure speech of all the people. The Tower of Babel is reversed, Right? The future worship in Yahweh's temple. By the way, some people think 
we don't know what will happen. What language will we speak in heaven? All the Old Testament professors say it's going to be Hebrew. So uh, at least my Old Testament professors said that. I mean, we don't know. I heard, I heard someone recently say that maybe we'll speak all the languages we already know and we'll just all understand each other. And I have a very good friend in our church who's Korean and we've talked about me learning Korean and I don't want to even try. It's too hard. And I'm too old. But he came up to me and he goes, Tom, you are going to get to know Korean in the new creation. 